Hello everyone, this is Terry with Futures IO, and as always, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome Dave Force and Dominic Ticello from DTN IQ Feed for today's webinar, Current Events and Commodity F Futures, Commodity Markets, Influence in Crowd Psychology. If you have questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box throughout the webinar, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, you can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, using at Futures.io. And now, without further delay, I will hand it over to Dave... And you should get the pop-up to share your screen again. Okay, you ready? Looking good. All right. Well, thank you, Terry. And thank all of you for attending today's webinar. And a big thank you to uh, Big Mike and Futures.io for allowing us this time today. Uh, my name is Dave Force. I started with DTN back in 1993. I'll begin with a brief overview of DTN and our market data service IQ feed. Dominic Ciricella, will, uh, the Director of Risk Management Trading and Advisory Services with EMI DTN, will then take over. Dominic has thousands of hours of training experience and has taught trading and the markets to hundreds of businesses. He'll be focusing today on how current events are influencing the markets and trader psychology. The special IQ feed free trial link for futures.io members you see at the top of this page will be repeated later and again at the end of the webinar during the question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please jot them down and we'll answer them after the presentation. But first, I want to mention that Futures.io has the best futures trading community on the planet with over 75,000 members, many of which are IQ feed users. DTN, the company, has its roots in Omaha, Nebraska, originally publicly traded on NASDAQ providing grain and livestock data to area farmers. Today, DTN is an independently operated division of a multi-billion dollar private equity firm based in Geneva, Switzerland called TBG. We still are the premier provider of data to US farmers, but now we're also the number one weather information provider in the US the largest provider of data for the energy industry in North America, and IQ feed market data is, is used by traders in over 100 countries. Even though all of these divisions are expanding globally, our primary data center and about 500 D10 employees like myself are still working out of the Omaha, Nebraska office. DTN has four primary divisions. Our original division, agriculture, where our first focus was providing grain and livestock quotes to farmers, we originally sent this data over an FM signal. The data was received by antennas that were installed on nearby towns water towers, and the farmer would receive the quotes via our patented receiver and view them on a monochrome computer screen like this one. We expanded our coverage by renting space on the Galaxy 4 satellite. This enabled us to now reach anyone in the continental U.S. and most of the southern half of Canada. For a few years in the 90s, we also rented a VBI sideband from Turner Broadcasting. Anyone having a Turner channel on their cable TV, like TBS, could use our special receiver box to see the same market data without having to install a satellite dish outside. Traders, not just farmers, in the city were now accessing market data from our ever-expanding coverage of other future and stock market exchanges. Today, with the internet and uh, cellular broadcasts, any farmer anywhere with a laptop 
notepad, iPad, or smartphone can watch markets in real time. The second division is our weather services. Thousands of farmers have installed the DTN weather station on their farms. So they are receiving extremely accurate forecasts specific to their location. These forecasts are produced by our staff of over 50 meteorologists. However, farmers aren't the only ones that need accurate weather information. For example, many state departments of transportation rely on DTN weather for scheduling snow removal and ice treatment. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security relies on DTN weather to track and forecast major storms for advanced planning. And for the safety of participants, players, students, and employees, DTN weather is used by NFL and NCAA football, Major League Baseball, and the College World Series, the PGA, and many other college sports, city school districts, hospitals, construction, and other companies. And even traders are using weather information to help make decisions on commodities that are affected by weather conditions. The third major division of DTN is the Refined Fuels Division, which manages 80% of the refined fuel supply chain pricing and billing transactions in North America, from production to distribution with over 280 unique products at over 1,200 terminals, keeping track of every drop all the way to the pump. So when you are filling up the family car, chances are DTN is calculating and relaying this information to the supplier. The fourth division of DTN is market data, the division that I work in, stocks, options, mutual funds, Forex data, news and analysis. If you have any questions on the market data or the futures.io special, please jot them down and we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the webinar. Nowadays, with worldwide internet accessibility, an FM antenna or satellite dish is no longer needed. Traders in over 100 countries are trading right from their homes. Some are now trading on the ocean beach or even on the actual ocean, while other traders are making investment decisions in the park while on summer vacation or in the mountains on winter holiday. In other words, if you have access to the internet, you have access to IQ feed market data. The IQ feed data is true, tick by tick, completely unfiltered. So it allows you to see every trade the exchange sends out in real time. You could be missing more than 50% of the actual trades with your current service if it isn't true tick by tick. While other quote feeds resell data from third parties, our domestic quote data from IQ feed is direct from each exchange. Our feeds are the fastest because we eliminate the middleman. We own and manage our own data center, which is manned 24 7, 365. Our primary data center doesn't rely on third parties or co-location facilities. So by controlling our fully redundant systems, we are capable to react immediately or before an outage occurs. Other third-party quote vendors don't have the infrastructure and bandwidth to handle today's high volume markets. Our quad redundant ticker plant was built with today's technology. This means you receive the fastest, most complete and reliable data available. Most IQ feed users are feeding the data into one or more of the 80 plus popular compatible third party charting and technical analysis software programs. You can also DDE link the IQ feed data directly into an Excel spreadsheet, or if you have the ability, you can use our API software developers kit and write your own custom software. Included at no extra cost with a base IQ feed service are several real-time news wires. These include our in-house DTN newsroom, the real-time trader service, the PR news wire, business wire, and the pro version of Benzinga News. 
These free services produce over 1,000 market-related stories every day. In addition to these free services, we have add-on premium news services that include Dow Jones, Reuters, and many others. The USDA report and the Commitment of Traders reports and many more are also available add-ons. In addition to computer access, you now have mobile access. Keep on top of the markets wherever you go. Using your smartphone, iPad, or tablet, you can create a personal quote list of up to 100 symbols and customize the charts and refresh cycle. IQ Feed is competitively priced for the average individual trader, <coughs> but we've negotiated an even better value for Futures.io members. We've doubled the free trial period for Futures.io members from 7 to 14 days. We've eliminated the startup fee. And when a Futures.io member first subscribes to IQ Feed, they get the first three months at half price. However, in order to receive this special, you have to sign up through the special futures.io link. One way to start is by going to the IQ Feed homepage for futures.io members, www.iqfeed.net slash futures.io. Then under the heading about IQ Feed, click on the get free trial now link. This website is available 24 seven. You can write this link down now if you want, but after Dominic's presentation, he'll be displaying it again. Then after the initial three month subscription at half price, you'll then need to choose how to continue the subscription. There are four choices. The first option is month to month at the full regular rate or you can continue quarterly, but with a 10% discount, or annually with a 20% discount, or prepay two years with a 30% discount. The annual and two-year plans include, at no extra charge, the smartphone app, which is normally a $20 per month add-on. Here's the direct free trial link again. If you have any questions on IQ Feed after the webinar, or need any help signing up for the free trial, contact me, Dave Force, by phone, email, or through our online chat. We'll have the links and contact information again at the end of the webinar after the question and answer segment. And now, here is Dominic Chiricella to talk to you about how current events influence markets and trading psychology. Dominic? Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, everybody sees my screen up there? I want to make sure it's working right, I hope. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit today. First of all, my name is Dominic Chiricella. Uh I'm new to DTN, uh, in that DTN just acquired my company uh, on April the 10th. Uh, we've been, uh, the Energy Management Institute has been in the um, uh, trading and uh, uh, commodity and energy uh, education and advisory services business for the last uh, 17 years. Uh, and before that, I ran three large uh, international trading companies. So uh, with that, let's talk a little bit. I think this is a very interesting topic uh, and obviously a one that, that's uh, uh, dynamically changing, uh, obviously, uh, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. The way I kind of broke up my presentation today uh, is, is uh, looking at uh, two major time frames. Last year, which was a decidedly different environment than we are this year. I'm going to just talk about three instruments that are closely related, the mini S&P, uh, the dollar index, and I'm going to use Brent as the surrogate, uh, Brent crude oil contract as the surrogate for oil. Uh, crude oil is, is positively correlated, not all the time, uh, but to the equity markets and obviously the mini S&P uh, and Brent crude oil is inversely correlated to the uh, dollar index. Again, not all the time, uh, but uh, a good portion of the times. So I'll talk about in this first section uh, some price comparisons across 2017. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the events that drove uh, the markets in 17 uh, and ultimately how that translated into uh, the market sentiment and market psychology in 2017. Then I'll flip gears and we'll look at a distinctly different environment 
uh, and the environment we're in through 2018, actually since about February, uh, when everything started uh, changing here, uh, and as we are today. Uh, and, and I'll talk about those events, I'll talk about the market sentiment, uh, and then uh, I'll just give you my opinion as to uh, how I see the rest of 2018 and, and beyond. And again, if you have any questions, jot them down, and I'd love to answer them, and you can uh, type them in at the bottom of the um, um, uh, viewing area. So obviously, May uh, markets in 2017 uh, were just wonderful for equities. President Trump was inaugurated on January the 20th. Uh, as he came into office, uh, he had a bit of a kickstart already. Market started moving positively uh, in the fourth quarter of 2016. Uh, the economic data uh, was starting to improve. The data points that were coming out weekly uh, were all relatively positive. Uh, the economy was growing. Uh, the central bank was still indicating no major policy changes. Rates were still low and stable. Uh, and the rest of the global economy was relatively stable and, in fact, was even starting to grow. Europe was starting to look more positive uh, than it was in 2015, 2016. Uh, Asia was still looking good. Uh, we have yet to have talked about trade wars or all of the other uh, gyrations that have, have uh, changed the market uh, today. On the oil side, many geopolitical events uh, were transpiring. OPEC and Russia uh, entered into a, uh, an agreement in 2016 to shore up oil prices, uh, and uh, that was well on its way. Uh, a lot of geopolitical events in places like Venezuela, whose economy uh, was starting to spiral out of control. Um, uh, Libya, which even to today remains completely unstable, Angola, Nigeria, uh, Iran, uh, the proxy war going on uh, in Yemen between Saudi Arabia and Iran, all factors leading to uh, relatively substantial declines in available crude capacity and production coming into the world. Uh, and for the first time in the history of OPEC, and OPEC formed in 1960, uh, and the first time in its history, uh, they ran at a very, very high compliance rate. Uh, OPEC has been known, uh, and Russia, along with OPEC, have been known to basically uh, come to agreements on production in, in the past and pretty quickly start cheating on those production deals. This was just the opposite. Uh, so global inventories, which were in a massive surplus, uh, which pushed oil prices all the way on down to $30 a barrel, uh, entered into a pretty solid and, and um, ongoing uh, destocking pattern. So again, we entered this first year of a new presidency, and, and if you look at the um, uh, Traders' Almanac and some of the other publications, normally the first year of a presidency is relatively optimistic. Uh, it's usually positive for the economy, and this one was no different. Uh, President Trump uh, quickly started working on some of the things he talked about uh, in his campaign, unraveling business regulations, uh, and right out of the get-go started uh, issuing uh, many uh, executive orders to start uh, uh, eliminating some of the uh, regulatory burdens, uh, and then quickly worked with Congress to... Um, uh, implement tax cuts. All very positive factors, very positive for the market sentiment. Uh, equity markets uh, responded very favorable. Uh, projection of corporate earnings going up. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, the weekly economic data uh, basically now started to confirm a lot of what we were anticipating back in the fourth quarter of 2016 and even uh, in early January and February of 17 when, when uh, President Trump first uh, took office. So the net result was we were getting confirmation now, further supporting the upward trend in equities, further adding to a positive sentiment and market psychology. And then as we got into Q1, Q2 earnings from the corp from the corporate world, uh, again, beating expectations, further fueling market sentiment and psychology, not very many bumps in the road. Uh, almost all the signs were positive for equities. 
uh, the fear and greed index, the VIX, uh, we're all very, very supportive for an upward trend. Uh, the trend is my friend type of a market psychology. Uh, not really a complicated market to trade. If we look at the daily spot uh, E-mini index throughout 2017, uh, a very, very nice, easily uh, cycling uptrend, an easy market to trade. Uh, most of the uh, or any combination of trending indicators, whether it be moving averages, moving average crosses, or or any of your favorite uh, type trending indicators, all work very, very nicely uh, through 2017. As we got into the third and fourth quarter, that trend actually even accelerated uh, as the tax cuts started funneling in as corporate earnings continued to grow. Uh, and most importantly, uh, volatility as we look down at average annualized volatility remaining at relatively low levels. So uh, a wonderful picture on the equity side as we ended uh, 2017 and started looking towards uh, uh, what one would have thought been a continuation into 2018. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little while. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the currency side of the market. And um, obviously, as I said before, in the early stages, the central bank uh, indicated that the economy was growing, but it was not at an uncontrollable pace. Uh, they didn't expect any spikes. Uh, we started with a relatively low GDP of 2.65 uh, to start 2017. Unemployment uh, was at 4.1 percent. The uh, participation rate was, uh, I believe, in the high sixes, low sevens, uh, and inflation was just hovering at around uh, 2% annualized. So uh, a pretty nice, comfortable market, uh, and the Fed uh, was basically saying, okay, it's looking like we may uh, have to start doing something, uh, but we're starting off a very, very low interest rate environment. So uh, during the course of 2017, the Fed increased uh, rates three times, March, June, and December, by 25 basis points. Uh, but it was a very slow, very calculated, and the market absorbed it very, very well. So well uh, that basically um, the dollar continued, the dollar index, which is a large percentage against the euro, uh, basically continued to uh, be in a downtrend. So we didn't get, you know, obviously interest rates being relative interest rates in one currency relative to other currencies being the main fundamental uh, element in uh, the direction of interest rates. Obviously, these uh, 75 basis points across uh, 2017 were not really viewed as uh, something that, that really justified a shift in the dollar sentiment. So the dollar sentiment uh, versus most major currencies remained negative uh, through uh, 2017. So again, uh, uh, much like with the equity market here, uh, we had a very, very nice uh, cycling downtrend, uh, a very trendy market, a market that worked very nicely with, again, any plethora of, of um, uh, 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 trending indicators you may use or uh, any, any fundamental data that you are incorporating it. All the fundamental data was suggesting uh, the dollar should move lower. Uh, and again, the volatility of the dollar was relatively low on an annualized basis. Uh, and again, uh, uh, looking like a setup heading into 2018 of being kind of more of the same uh, as we finished up uh, in December. On the oil side, at the end of 2016, November 2016, OPEC, as I mentioned, and Russia and a few other uh, producers decided to uh, eliminate the global surplus, eliminate uh, 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 this, 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 this market share war that was going on uh, with U.S. shale producers for uh, a couple of years, going back to 20, uh, 2014, 2015. Uh, and the market uh, was very bearish, and it stayed bearish, even though OPEC decided to cut production uh, significantly. Uh, and as I said before, at a relatively high compliance level. So we've kind of, uh, you have to recognize the long lag time, uh, especially when we've come off a very, very, very sucrose environment for this commodity. Uh, we, the market had to be convinced 
that the surplus was going to start dwindling. Uh, and it was, it was kind of a record level uh, or a record surplus, if I can uh, say that. Uh, but on the positive side, even though the trend was still down a bit, uh, global demand was growing, as we talked about before. Uh, the U.S. economy was very favorable. Uh, the European economy was improving. China uh, was doing well. Um, and there were many geopolitical events uh, that forced OPEC to be well over 100 percent compliance. Venezuela was losing production. Uh, Angola was losing production. Libya was losing production. Uh, so key OPEC members couldn't even uh, come anywhere near uh, the compliance level, and they were running at 50, 60 percent uh, of what their compliance. And lo and behold, as we got into uh, the uh, or part of 2018, you won't see it in the next chart. Uh, well, you won't see it in the first part of the next chart, but inventories were destocking, and Brent started turning around here a little bit. And lo and behold, uh, we saw this, this early part of the year was a very, very range uh, going nowhere market. Uh, we had a, a wide, volatile uh, downward trend. And then about the middle of the year, oil finally took hold, finally embarked in an uptrend as the industry became uh, convinced uh, that the days of, of flooding the, 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 the world with oil were over, at least at this stage of the game. Inventories were going down, very favorable fundamentals very favorable economic conditions, economic growth. Obviously, oil consumption is highly correlated to um, economic growth, especially in the developing world economies. And all of those positives exist nicely. And again, as we got to that second half, a very, very uh, steady market that worked very nicely um, with trending indicators and, and uh, uh, buy and hold type uh, hedges here. So to summarize 2017, uh, uh, the market sentiment was very, very much long equities, long equity indices, whatever they may happen to be. Uh, U.S. was outperforming some of the emerging market uh, areas. Uh, but in general, global equities were rising, uh, some more than others, obviously. Uh, we were also market sentiment that pushed us to being mostly short the dollar index. Uh, and as I said, uh, about the middle of the year uh, is is when uh, oil took off and and uh, it was a long Brent market or a long oil in general market. Uh, so the market sentiment, the market psychology, really was very positive. A buy dip, stay long type sentiment on the equity side. Sell rallies, stay short uh, on the dollar side, and by mid year, buy dip, stay long on the oil side, and basically. Uh, it was a, a, a trend trading type of an environment. Doesn't mean the short-term traders, doesn't mean the day traders uh, weren't very uh, uh, prevalent in the systems that they use. But in general, for the trend traders, this was a great year for most of the equity and commodity markets around. Certainly, if you're a very successful day trader, it only added to your uh, uh, ability and most likely enhanced your individual trading systems and being able to uh, extract money from the market. So uh, a good market, not a lot of headwinds, uh, not a lot of concerns. Uh, there weren't a lot of 30-second news snippets hitting the market to derail it. Uh, and certainly there weren't a lot of negative tweets coming from Washington, D.C. to also derail the market. So most things were positive. And then we turned the corner. And we walked into 2018. Uh, in the early part of 2018, January was pretty good. Uh, and we started out as a continuation of 18. Uh, we made new highs in equities. Uh, we made new highs in oil. The dollar was still uh, hovering uh, to the downside. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, a very contentious political environment in the United States became even more contentious. Uh, and obviously, the two parties... Uh, have been warring with each other uh, to the fullest extent possible, and it's only gotten worse. Uh, and now on top of that, uh, we originally in 2018 started seeing the early stages of tariffs and, and trade wars, and we started with steel and aluminum. Uh, and now we're at that stage 
uh, where the president has asked his people to look at uh, additional tariffs on $200 billion worth of uh, goods coming in from China. Uh, and China quickly responding just the other day uh, that they're going to come up with uh, whatever their retaliation is. Uh, they don't import $200 billion worth of goods from the United States. So whatever they do, it's probably going to be something related to the bond market. Uh, they hold a lot of treasuries. So uh, we could see something where they can start selling uh, treasuries, which would uh, obviously result in pushing interest rates higher, uh, which can then have a negative impact on the total uh, U.S. economy. And it could uh, basically push the Fed uh, to accelerate uh, uh, their increase in interest rates. So that's just one thought. I mean, let's see what uh, we still have to see what China does come out with. So that's kind of in the works. Uh, economic data, U.S. economic data, has still been improving throughout most of 2018. Uh, economic growth, though, uh, could be starting to stall. Obviously, a trade war uh, is not good for China or the United States or Europe, for that matter. Um, so we could start seeing uh, economic growth stalling here a little bit. Uh, the central bank is signaling uh, a little more aggressive nature, uh, maybe four uh, rate increases this year. And again, depending on what happens uh, with the trade war, uh, it could be more than that. And the increment could be greater than uh, the expected 25 basis point. Uh, per rate increase. Uh, so we have a lot of uncertainty, uh, and we've had this uncertainty through since uh, since February. Uh, we had a big sell-off in the market in February as participants started uh, looking at all of these things, and as this 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 kind of almost euphoric market sentiment and psychology uh, quickly shattered, and all of a sudden uh, we now are working in an area of uncertainty. Uh, potential trade wars, uh, more geopolitical events uh, impacting oil. Uh, and, and again, the more uncertainty, the more uh, 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 potential loss of uh, uh, oil production uh, could ultimately result in spiking prices, which again is another negative uh, for our economy here in the United States as well as the uh, global economy. Now, with that, OPEC came out on June 22nd and said, uh, we're gonna increase production about a million barrels a day, quite substantially. Uh, and the market has completely ignored it up until a couple of days ago. In fact, the market rose uh, consistently and strongly from the day OPEC said they were gonna increase production because the market was more concerned about the loss of production from uh, Venezuela, from Angola, uh, from uh, uh, sanctions that are going to be placed on Iran in November. In fact, Iranian production in July is already 500,000 barrels a day below where it was in uh, June. Uh, and the sanctions are not on yet. Companies are pulling back in anticipation. Even though the United States is going alone on the sanctions, uh, it, 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 it impacts the whole banking environment and a lot of companies that have already been buying uh, from Iran are starting to pull back on those purchases. Uh, and global inventories are still destocking. So uh, we have a, a very, very um, unstable environment. So the second year of this presidency, uh, it's still optimistic, but I like to call it cautiously optimistic uh, and cautiously positive to the economy. We haven't seen any negatives yet. On the uh, earnings side, we'll be getting the earnings cycle starting here pretty soon, uh, and and uh, it's it's anticipated uh, from most of the analyst projections that it should be uh, another good quarter of earnings. Uh, but the economy is getting a little bit rocky. We saw just today uh, inflation is at the highest level uh, in a long time. Now this highest level is pretty low compared to uh, you know you go back a lot in history when we were looking at double-digit inflation. We're nothing like that. We're talking about 2.4 percentage, something in that vicinity. Uh, but it's higher than where it was. Uh, and, and, and that's got the market uncertain. That's got the market uh, in concern. Uh, tax reform uh, is, is uh, uh, still in play, and we're seeing uh, the, the, uh, that being implemented over time. Uh, the labor market is still very good, but it could be tightening here a little bit. Uh, it's hard to ride around any place in the United States and not see uh, 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 job uh, uh, help wanted ads all over the place. I think for the first time last month, uh, there were more 
open jobs than there were people on unemployment. I think that's the first time in could be history for the United States, probably not history, but many, 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 many years in the past. But the single biggest factor right now that's creating the largest cloud in the market is what's going to happen with tariffs. Is this going to be a trade war between the United States and China? Is there going to be a trade war between the United States and Europe? Or is this truly a negotiating tactic on everybody's part right now? And will this all uh, basically wind down here in the next three to six months? Big question. Big enough question that it's taken a lot of those buy and hold people out of the marketplace. There's not a lot of great uh, upside um, uh, 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 support to basically close one's eyes, go long and stay long in equities or go long and stay long in um, uh, 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 oil at the moment. Much more so, uh, we're looking at very short-term type moves that people are trying to capture and extract money from. Uh, volatility soared in Q1, and that was really uh, uh, tantamount with the equity sell-off that we saw. And again, that very negative, uh, that fear index really, really, really uh, shifted completely to the fear side of the situation. Volatility is kind of stabilized in equities over the last couple of months, but it's still a very cautious market. Uh, eco e, the weekly economic data uh, is still uh, pointing to, to, to growth, but again, some indications that were slipping. Again, that, 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 in, that inflation data we saw today uh, makes one want to be a little bit more uh, cautious along the way. Uh, we'll have to watch the, the earnings here. Again, they're projected to be uh, very positive. This new round of earnings coming out. Uh, and that can fuel the market sentiment and psychology one way or the other along the way. But one thing we could be certain of right now, there's going to be more bumps in the road. Uh, everything is not positive for the equity markets. Uh, the, the fear index is, is itself uh, uh, shifting back and forth, uh, and we'll have to watch uh, where we're going. So in the net result, when we look at uh, the uh, E-mini chart, uh, we can see how that's traded throughout 2018 so far, uh, and it's very, very representative of this kind of uncertain market we had. Uh, we went into a pretty good sell-off very early in February, uh, and a basically some recovery, but uh, you know, trending lower over the first half of the year. We may have put in a little bit of a bottom here around April, early May, uh, and we've been slowly in an uptrend but more of a range trading type uptrend. Uh, again, much more, um, much more of, of a market where uh, higher probability of success comes from uh, a shorter term uh, outlook on the market rather than a, a longer term outlook on the market. Volatility has stabilized here during the, the April through July period, uh, but it's still running above where it was last year when we just went nowhere but up on equities. And you could see how high uh, volatility was, almost 30% here uh, when we had our sell-off uh, early on in the year. So a very, very good indicator as to when to um, uh, jump. And, and certainly, uh, you know, everybody got on the bandwagon here, and we got the herd mentality hitting the market here for the first couple of weeks there uh, in February. On the uh, dollar side, again, with the Fed being more aggressive, uh, the market sentiment has shifted. Uh, it shifted on the dollar. Uh, the dollar has become a little bit firmer versus most currencies. Uh, it's become firmer uh, versus the um, uh, or ver firmer for the uh, dollar index. Uh, the ECB uh, is uh, uh, starting to uh, uh, close down their balance sheet. They're, they're projecting uh, a reduction in their quantitative easing program by the end of this year. Uh, but they're going to hold rates steady. They're still running at a negative uh, interest rate. So uh, that's kind of not very bullish for the euro, more bullish for the dollar-euro switch. Uh, and again, that's contributing to the uh, more positive sentiment associated with the uh, dollar. Uh, global unrest, geopolitical events uh, in places like the Middle East and Venezuela and elsewhere, North Korea, uh, are certainly uh, a positive for the dollar, and that's contributing uh, to the dollar index rising here of late. 
uh, the tariff talk, the potential trade wars uh, favors uh, the dollar more than it favors the yuan or more than it favors uh, the ECB. Uh, and just on the surface, if you look at at least the early stages, if we call this the early stages of a trade war, uh, the uh, Chinese Shanghai A equities are uh, significantly down double digits where the Dow is kind of hovering either side of uh, unchanged here. So it's looking like the market is putting more of an impact towards the Chinese side of the equation. And the 10-year um, uh, Treasury still hovering around uh, 3%, uh, positive for the uh, market sentiment. Uh, and that can uh, wind up uh, reflecting much higher interest rates if, in fact, China does retaliate with some sort of uh, a move on the treasuries that uh, they hold. They just hold an enormous amount of U.S. treasuries. So when we look at that, uh, the first part of this year, uh, we were kind of in a, in a trading range on the dollar. And again, remember, that was coming off of uh, a pretty steadily declining dollar in 2017. Uh, and this kind of became a bit of our stabilizing or bottoming pattern uh, over a couple of months. And now we've embarked on that kind of move to the upside, much more of a trending market. Uh, we have a little bit of a caution flag over the last week or so where the dollar has uh, broke below the uh, the trend line for 2018. Uh, volatility is starting to rise here a little bit. Uh, so this uptrend uh, could be shifting here a little bit. Uh, so again, this is creating another level uh, or another uh, uh, threshold of uncertainty uh, in the whole currency pick that we need to be looking at. So let's look at the market sentiment then on the currency, uh, excuse me, on the oil side. Uh, the, the oil fundamentals are, are still bullish. Uh, the market is still positive, still positive market sentiment, still positive market psychology. But the last couple of days uh, of this week has really done a lot of technical damage to the market. It's done a lot of technical, uh, it's done a lot of damage to the market sentiment. Uh, we had a huge move to the downside. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of the herd uh, ran for cover here uh, as the market has been in this battle between production increasing by OPEC and even further by the Saudi Arabian king's pledge to President Trump uh, to, to meet whatever demand there is. And on the other hand, uh, Libyan production coming back, uh, the... the, the um, uh, Iranian production going down. So we have a lot, a lot of uncertainty along the way. Uh, the geopolitics are there. They're not getting any, uh, any, any, any more stable. In fact, they're getting more and more unstable. Uh, sanctions on Iran uh, are obviously a bullish factor, although this week we saw uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, Secretary of State say uh, the U.S. may grant some relief on sanctions to some select countries that do buy oil from Iran. So a bit of a change in what we saw uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And that's not unusual. Uh, we're in this market. 2018 is a market where uh, we see a tweet saying one thing one day, saying another thing a week later. Uh, so there's just a lot of, of, of information in both directions that the market has to digest. And, and that's why the market's trading uh, the way it's been trading along the way. So the market psychology, I would call it uh, cautious, uh, and it could be changing. We were bullish. Uh, we're still somewhat positive, but we could be changing to a period of, of uh, uh, a downward move here uh, in the next uh, month or so. And again, you could see uh, throughout most of 2018, uh, that uptrend, uh, we held in a nice upward trading channel. Uh, between the 2017 upward trend line uh, on the upside and the new trend line from 2018. Uh, most uh, uh, long-term trading indicators work nicely, uh, but this is where we're having problems right now. Uh, you know, we, 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 we dropped below this line in mid-June, and that raised a caution flag. Uh, but then, and this is when OPEC announced their production increases. The market went to the races on it. Uh, and, and paid less attention to it than the uh, geopolitical events. We've kind of 
uh, put a little bit of a topping area, and then bing, we crumbled here uh, yesterday. Today we recovered here a little bit, not so much. Uh, so this is a huge caution flag, uh, and we could now be seeing the very, very early stages of maybe the, maybe the market moving down uh, to the mid-60s here uh, for Brent and, and, and checking out some of the support from uh, earlier in the year. So 2018 events, obviously, uh, for equities, uh, uh, we're still looking at range trading as being the way to go, short-term trading, uh, day trading, uh, buy and hold, uh, or sell and hold, uh, uh, not high percentage trades, much more laden with risk than, uh, than reward. Uh, we still like being along the dollar. We still think the uh, trend is to the upside, uh, but again, we want to uh you know raise the yellow flag on being cautious in that particular area uh, as we did break some uh, uh some key areas uh i'd say neutral on brent neutral on oil in general uh the market sentiment may very well uh be changing here so equity market sentiment psychology i see neutral uh for pretty much uh the next month two months until we uh, until really we're proven uh, otherwise i i don't see uh, any reason why that's going to change unless, of course, uh, we see a huge shift in the whole trade war. Um, I think we're looking at pent-up uh, upside in equities, significant pent-up upside in equities uh, with tax cuts, with corporate earnings doing well, if the trade wars go away. If the trade wars don't go away, uh, certainly this neutral figure is going to be much more of a uh, bearish figure uh, and, and shifting to a bearish figure. Uh, the dollar, I still see more upside. I still see uh, that being a trending indicator. I expect to see that stay where it is for the moment. Uh, and oil, again, until we sort out this battle between increases in production and losses due to geopolitics, uh, I think the optimum trade for oil is the sidelines and or just uh, uh, short term uh, day trades or one to two day trades take advantage of short term moves up and down uh, in the market. So uh, trend trading, I look at that as still being in play for the dollar index, uh, more of a range trading environment um, for oil uh, and, and equities uh, going forward. So for the rest of 2018, uh, risk is just growing. Uh, it, it's, it's not it's not 2017 by any uh, scope of the imagination. As I said, uh, if we can get a handle on tariffs, if we can get consistent, uh, if we can see the U.S. and China and the U.S. and Europe truly entering into a negotiating stance in U.S. and uh, NAFTA or with Mexico and uh, Canada, if we see all of these factors resulting in positive comments coming from negotiations, uh, a lot of the market risk we're facing today is going to go away. Uh, until we see that, uh, the risk is going to grow rather than the upside uh, on uh, equities. And then that result, that risk is going to have an impact on economic growth. It's going to have an impact on corporate earnings uh, at some point in time in the United States and outside the, the United States. Um, it's also going to result in higher short-term interest rates. My biggest concern on the interest rate side is, yes, a bit from the inflation, uh, but I think as the Fed raises interest rates another two or three times this year, barring nothing crazy on the tariff side, I think that'll keep interest that'll keep inflation uh, or cap it at least for the time being. Uh, the biggest concern I have on interest rates is if China does something in retaliation using its its uh, uh, huge uh, inventory of U.S. bonds that it owns. Um, the potential trade wars, unfortunately, everything I said, the trade wars were elevated in the last week or so. So uh, they're not seeming to go away. Uh, and maybe this is uh, another stage of uh, uh, negotiations. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the market is, I would say the market is, is, is uh, cutting the U.S. cutting President Trump some slack here, and 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 they are interpreting uh, these tweets as somewhat 
of a negotiating stance. Otherwise, the equity market's probably down one to 2,000 points from where it's at. In fact, uh, we had a pretty good recovery in equities today, kind of offset what we lost yesterday. But it's also a demonstration of this volatility, the short-term moves that uh, are the opportunity for uh, making money here in most of these commodities. And I think it'll be like this uh, going forward. I think there's a risk, a higher risk of lower oil prices uh, rather than uh, increased oil prices uh, with the production increases going hold. Uh, I don't believe buy and hold in equities is going to be the trade. I think it's short-term trading. Uh, and I think we're going to have a high volatility in currency, uh, in the currency and commodity markets. And um, I think uh, most of those markets like oil, uh, buy and hold is not going to be, or sell and, and, and hold is not going to be uh, the trades for the rest of this year. Again, it's going to be much more uh, short-term or, oriented. So thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I thank you all for coming. I know you're all busy traders. Uh, I know you all have uh, a million things to juggle, but uh, thank you very much. Hi, guys. If you have any questions, please feel free to start typing them into the questions box, and I'll ask them to uh, Dave and Dominic. Dave, there is one question. What is the fee after the initial period for IQ feed? Uh, IQ feed with real-time futures is $102 per month uh, plus exchange fees. Um, the first quarter, that works out to $153 savings when you do the half price. Uh, after that, the month-to-month -month is $102 uh, plus exchange fees. Most of the uh, futures.io uh, users are non-professional active traders, and they do qualify and get approved for the Globex exchange fee waiver, which uh, gives you the four Globex exchanges, CME, CBOT, COMEX, and NYMEX, at a reduced uh, exchange fee that totals just $3 a month. So you're looking at $105 a month after the initial three-month period if you go on the regular month-to-month -month plan. Okay. I give them a couple more minutes to type questions in if they have any. Uh, let's see. Do you foresee global QE and IRP, ZIRP affecting the carry trade in 2018? I mean, that's, that's a tough one, too. It's also actually going to depend on on um, uh, how this thing whole involves with all the tariffs without and how the central bank uh, start uh, uh, getting aggressive or non-aggressive. So uh, I, I'm uncertain as to how that's going to evolve here in 2018. I think that there's a much higher probability uh, that uh, right now we're looking at everything that certainly interest rates are going to rise and it's going to affect the curve. Uh, and it's going to affect the carry in the market. Okay. Do you... Okay, this question, I'm going to try to see if I can figure out how to formulate this question. How and when would we know if a trade war between, say, United States and China is actually in effect? Or is it just one of these things where the tariffs just keep getting lobbed on each side? I, I think that's a good question. Uh, right now, it's in effect. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have uh, $25 billion worth of tariffs on either side or from both sides of the equation right now. Uh, we have uh, the U.S. getting ready to place uh, another 200 billion of tariffs. So for the moment now, I'd have to say it's on. It's not very severe. $25 billion uh, in, in, uh, in the U.S. economy is, is a trickle. Uh, but uh, if it starts, does get to the $200 billion level, if China does firmly retaliate, uh, then we're going to know it's on and we're going to know it's on in a big way. Now, if we don't see, if we don't see this $200 billion uh, actually getting implemented. We don't see China. Uh, China's, China has said 
consistently that they will not initiate anything. They'll only retaliate. So obviously, if the U.S. doesn't add this $200 billion, uh, then certainly China is not going to do anything. And if this the United States doesn't add this $200 billion in the next couple of weeks, then I would say negotiations are going on and negotiations are probably getting closer. Uh, so, I mean, th those are the signals that I would be uh, looking at. And obviously, there's going to probably be 100 tweets about it uh, over the next couple of weeks and depends on which one you believe. Okay. Uh, what sectors are most at risk for volatility changes related to the tariffs? I'd say uh, most of the commodity-based companies, China is a, uh, obviously China is a, either the number one, two, or three commodity importer uh, in the world. Uh, they've already targeted with their retaliation uh, grain-type companies, soybeans, and so commodity-type companies would be high on the list. Uh, they've already said, that they were going to put a tariff on uh, or there's tariff on oil imports. Uh, they've been importing not a significant amount, only about 300,000 barrels a day. So uh, that could have a negative impact on the uh, producers, uh, the main uh, shale producers in the Permian and uh, Eagle Ford area and uh, areas like that. Uh, on the other side of the, of the pond, uh, the discussions going back and forth uh, between uh, the United States and Europe on tariff, obviously uh, the the uh, most at risk is going to be the automotive sector to start with. Okay. If the tariffs disappear, does that does that implied volatility collapse and the markets will then sharply rise? I think so. I think the route the more uh, uh, you know on the premise that we continue to be positive with earnings on the premise uh, that. You know, there's no other surprises with the economic data that's coming out. But I think, uh, you know, putting tariffs to bed uh, is certainly going to be the start of a very, very strong uh, move to the upside. So this could be nothing more than global sandbagging. Oh, yeah, it could very much be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, that's all the questions I see. We're getting close to the air mark. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dominic and Dave, for the uh, webinar today, for your time, and for uh, spending some time with us this evening. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Absolutely. Uh, Y'all take easy.